It's a wonderful day in the neighborhood. You know what? Uh, actually, we had a storm the last class, and everybody, a lot of everybody, a lot of people showed up in the midst of the storm. But today, it is so beautiful out there. It's like everybody's like, ah, go to Dr. Agan's class. Uh, I'm lucky to be here myself. Uh, we have a joke that we've been working on. A riddle. You want to tell us the riddle? And I forgot your name. What's your first name? Saba. Oh, Saba. Saba has this riddle. He's been tricking us all uh, in the hallway. And uh, I told him, ask him if he'd do it. He's guaranteed a C in the course if he does this. <laughs> well, it's more like a trick question. A I trick guess. question. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, there's 26 snakes. Two die. How many are left? 26 snakes. This is like uh, David, uh, what is his name? Letterman or something. 26 snakes. Two died. How many are left? 26 snakes, two die, how many are left? Should we let the people call in from the... No, just kidding. Does anybody have an answer to that? Take a shot. It's not 24. It's not 24, and it's not zero. I had them all slithering off. One. One's left? No. Nope. 26 are left? 118. Okay, he's shaking his head. Anybody else has an answer to that? 22. 22 are left. Two of the snakes eat each other and then die from poison that is in the two snakes. <laughs> that is such a reach. That is so bad. It's good though. It's good. It's, it's creative. It's a wrong answer, but it's a but it's a creative answer. I once had a class where this student missed. Uh, <laughs> this I was teaching at a actually Episcopal High School one summer. And the student said, he got to this question, and he said, I'm so sick of you talking about this, Dr. Agan. I don't even want to answer the question. And I gave him full credit because I was so assertive and so much the feeling of all of us. And uh, people go, he got full credit for being a smart aleck? Uh, what, what do you got? What's the answer? It's 18. 18? Yeah, you guys are like, you, you're not thinking through the question. There's 20 sick snakes. Uh, 20 sick snakes. You said 26. No, when I say it fast, it's, there's 26 snakes. Oh, that's stupid. So it yeah. sounds like... <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got to push the button because people out there need to watch. We, we have one more joke. Um, 26 sick snakes. Go ahead. What has four legs and can feed an entire family? Four legs and eats the entire family? Feed, no, and, can feed an entire family. And can family. feed the entire family? And can feed the entire family like a cow? A cow. No. What is it? You have the inner table. A table. We've regressed to junior high jokes. Okay, let's go. What happens when you mix an elephant with peanut butter? What do you get? No, you get an elephant that sticks to the roof of your mouth. Da dun dun. <laughs> you can tell it's getting near the end of the semester. And that's pretty good. Uh, 20s. You don't get it? No. You don't get that? No. Y'all ever eat peanut butter? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, in fact, uh, that little handout, since we're being jocular here. Hey, Charity. Good to see you showing up today. Thanks for dropping in. Uh, we'll just do this because it's kind of fun and zany, if I can find it. Uh, one of the handouts is, uh, these are kind of faux pas. One of my classes, uh, when we look at the shadow, it's always fun to do that. Uh, oh, here it is. One of the handouts I gave you, and I'll put it on the on this CD thing, I mean on the uh, internet, Handouts. Uh, it says, uh, humor is the prelude to faith and laughter is the beginning of prayer. This is kind of funny. It keeps us from taking our religious ideation a little too seriously. Because remember, we're talking about the eternal mystery of which nobody knows anything about. Although we all have powerful symbols and images that people will die for. Our, our understandings of intimations and encounters with God, the mystery. But this is kind of, this is a faux pas. This is from church bulletins. These are misprints. One of them is youth. our youth basketball team is back in action Wednesday at 8 p.m. in the recreation hall. Come out and watch us kill Christ the King. Nobody laughed. The next Sunday, as the family hayride, a bonfire will be at the Fowlers. Bring your hot dogs and guns. Friends are welcome. I think that's supposed to be buns. The peacemaking meeting 
is scheduled for today has been canceled due to a conflict. Sunday morning sermon, Jesus Walks on Water, sermon tonight, Searching for Jesus. These are all misprints and little church bulletins from uh, across the, the country, I guess. Remember in prayer, the many who are sick of our community is a misprint. This one's cute. Smile at someone who is hard to, hard to love. Say hell to someone who doesn't care much about you. I think that's supposed to be say hello. Does anybody get any of these? Yeah. Y'all get it? It's, these, are, these are faux pas. Here it is. Don't let worry kill you off. Let the church help. <laughs> Irving Benson and Jesse Carter was married on October 24th in the church. So ends a friendship that began in their school days. But uh, bump. your parents would love that. Go share that with your folks. They'll, they'll like that. The senior choir invites any member of the congregation who enjoys sinning to join the choir. Should have been singing. It was a misprint. Finally, someone asked. Uh, the scouts are saving aluminum cans and bottles and other items to be recycled. Proceeds will be used to cripple children. I think they miss, should be crippled children. Lutheran men, this is funny, Lutheran men's group, this mistake was written, uh, will meet at 6 p.m. Steak, mashed potatoes, green beans, bread, and dessert will be served for a nominal feel. But um, bump. Another mistake. For those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. I don't get that one. Please place your donation in the envelope with the deceased persons you want to be remembered. See, actually, that's a misplaced participle, isn't it? With the person, okay. The church will hold an evening of five dining, superb entertainment, and gracious hostility. <laughs> I've been to churches like that. It's supposed to be hospitality. Miss Print. Potluck supper, Sunday, at 5 p.m., prayer and medication to follow. That probably should be meditation. Ladies of the church have cast off clothing of every time, and they may be seen in the basement on Friday afternoon. Whoa. A couple of more. This evening at 7 p.m. there will be a hymn sing in the park across from the church. Bring a blanket and come prepared to sin. I think it's sing they're supposed to put there. The pastor would appreciate it if the ladies of the congregation would send their electric girdles for the pancakes breakfast. I think it's supposed to be griddles. See, these, this, this is another manifestation of the self of God, the mystery, who's the trickster. The trickster archetype. You know how we get so overly serious and we have to discover, you know, we're, we're just creatures. We're not the creator. We, get, we, we take ourselves too seriously at times. And often things happen that cause us to fumble. And uh, This one's neat. Uh, Weight Watchers will meet at 7 p.m. in the First Presbyterian Church. Use the large door on the side entrance. That is really not funny, but it's, it's a shadow, isn't it? Mrs. Johnson will be entering the hospital for testes. That's supposed to be tests, but I thought it was kind of funny. The associate minister unveiled the church's new tithing campaign, I up to my pledge, up yours. <laughs> that one usually cracks me up. And the last one is, our next song is Angels We Have Heard Get High. Um, you know, one of the universal marks of the mystery is that we all laugh. All cultures, every culture, every tribe has humor. Every uh, and, and that really, that's one of the places that we, we find commonality in, uh, in, in understanding in our human experience together. Okay, uh, we've been looking uh, today. I want to do, do several things. I want to I want to connect the. I want to look at the finish looking at the self, and I want to talk about ego and egocentricity, which is the real problem: is egocentricity. And then we'll have our presentations. And then, if there's time, I want to talk about projection. Uh, it's really what we've been doing the whole semester. We've been talking about projections. What, what, how we react negatively and positively to other people, groups, societies, races, ethnicities. Really tells us more about us than it does about them. And uh, I want to uh, look at that too. We'll also look at, as the, in the next two tapes, we'll look at uh, uh, stereotypes and what that's about. And then we'll look at uh, ways to build friendships with people. And I think you'll really like that because you can apply that to anybody, anywhere among the stuff. Okay, uh, so moving along here. Um, let me, uh, let me I, I added a few things about the self here that I wanted to 
show you on this. Try to widen this some. You'll see it's in blue. And the self, remember, is another word for the mystery or God within. It's, it's this... this uh, and what Jung helped us to see is that there is a... Uh, is that there's something else moving in life and not just the ego. And uh, the, the self, I added a couple of things that are important I forgot to. One is that it, it's that which creates, generates, and integrates life. This is a good test question. What is the self, capital S, in, in analytical psychology terms? See, there are two centers of the personality. One is the ego, and the importance of the ego is crucial. The other one is the self. There's something that's moving within us that causes things to happen. And this self is what, it's that what creates, generates, and integrates life. And, and we call that, that we, we, we would say colloquially, that's God. That's the mystery. We're, we're kind of looking at religions and, uh, uh, in relation to... Uh, the self is the great promoter of wholeness, healing. It's the unifier of, of all of life. It's sort of brings things together. It, it unites opposites. And I'll tell a little more about that in a minute. It's the center guiding force in realizing our potential. You know, those hunches we have, uh, that, that, that something that guides us, woos us. We looked at that. And then just a few other ones I put here. It, 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 the self would be the source of life, the ground of our being, God, Allah, the more, the mystery, whatever you want to call it. And I'm, I'm introducing this, and other, other psych, uh, uh, psychologists do it, and I'm not really defining God, per se, in terms of certain images you would have. This, we're ta the self would be uh, that which, is, uh, which moves within us uh, at a greater level than uh, our conscious will. And remember last time we looked at uh, we, that we encounter this self, we encounter the mystery, in, our, in relationships, and agonies, ecstasies, fairy tales, or things that humble us, uh, our dreams, crises, where we suddenly realize our limitations, uh, and we, 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 we encounter the deeper part of our self in projections, sacred stories, numinous experiences, uh, our religious experiences. All of these are about trying to get in touch with that other aspect of our own life. And uh, my great little... In fact, uh, before I put that up, let me do this. S see, when did the age of reason start? The age of enlightenment, scientism. Uh, let, let's kind of make it through history like this if we can. And the age of reason started out of the Middle Ages uh, with Copernicus discovering. What did Copernicus discover? That the sun is at the center of the universe and not the earth. And what did that cost him? Yeah, his life. Because who are you to say that? The sacred scriptures don't say that, and it cost him his life. But the age of reason came in, and science. And that's, we've been a very much a part of that. Modernity. Uh, uh, the, uh, Dar Darwin came out with his uh, uh, evolution. And in that, we thought we could figure everything out. And science is wonderful. And we, we thought we could, uh, through, uh, uh, through uh, observation... And experimentation, T A T I O N. We 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 learn about life because we have the mind, see, um, and knowledge, and we can gain it, and we do. And part of the whole uh, university program is gaining knowledge of the world, which we've gained, and and we're gaining it. They say that ninety percent of all the scientists that have ever lived are alive today. There's so much knowledge and, and, and interest and, and discovery of life that's just happening at rates beyond our imagination. You know, the computer you buy today will be, is probably already outdated because there's something in the, in the stream that has already bettered that, see. And it's good for the economy because it keeps you getting rid of the old and bringing in the new. But it's almost like our knowledge and discovery is moving so fast that we end up uh, with knowledge and reason and the, the power of the mind as an uh, is really the center of 
of human consciousness. And this power and reason led us to what's called modern living. In fact, they say now it would take 30, 23 slaves to do in the average kitchen of the middle-aged American what all your appliances do. And, and things that we all take for granted. You know, just a hundred years ago, people have to go out and get the water. They didn't have plumbing, toilets, uh, electricity, uh, you know, all the modern things that we all, that all of us in this room were born into at some level. Although I didn't get, we didn't get air conditioning until I was 10. We didn't get a TV until I was nine. Uh, but but uh, most of y'all have grown up in an era that, you know, if I talked about my childhood to you, <laughs> it would just... It, it's just so outdated because these co things that you, we all take for granted uh, came in then modern living. And so we have a world full of modernity. What's happened to us is we now are facing a postmodern world. It's called postmodernity. Now, this is what's weird. Half the world hasn't even gotten modern. Half the world has never used a telephone. Half the world lives on less than $2 a day. And so those of us in modernity, science, reason, the power of the ego, see where the ego is supreme, if you can think it, you can do it, ego supremacy uh, is the part of modern living. But we're discovering in the face of all of that, we still have wars, we still can't get along, we still are frightened and seek to overpower one another. Now, what happened in 1984 in a cinema, a movie, uh, Joseph Campbell, who's passed on now, who's a great uh, philosopher and um, uh, uh, culturalist, uh, looking at myths, of, of myths, the power of myth. In 1984, in a movie, there was a line that was said, and that line, he says, marks the end of modernity, marks the end of the age of science and reason. And it's a movie everyone in here has seen. Does anybody know what it is? Well, I'll tell you what it is. The movie was what? It was Star Wars. And Star Wars was the movie. The first movie that came out, I think the first Star Wars was the third in the progression or something. But the first, it was the fourth. Okay, the first Star Wars movie that came out, there was a line in that movie that Joseph Campbell said marks the end of the modern age, uh, the end of ego supremacy, the end of all of our mechanical devices and and, and, and uh, computers, and where it comes to the end of its road, and we can't computerize, modernize, ego, sort of egocentric eyes our life. I think I know a line of words. You do? Well, push, push the deal there. <laughs> I am your father. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's, that's interesting. He said, I am your father. No, what was it? Okay, I'll give you the scenario. Everybody knows it. Uh, Luke Skywalker is heading into the Death Star and uh, he's going down this tunnel and he's shooting and he can't get the computer to work and he's talking to I guess Obi-Wan Kenobi and Obi-Wan Kenobi he says I can't read the computers I don't know what to do and Obi-Wan Kenobi or, says something to him Use the force, Luke. <laughs> yeah that's it <laughs> yeah he says uh, trust the force Luke trust the force yeah that's it <laughs> Trust the force, Luke. <laughs> Do you remember that line? That came out, yeah, that came out in 77. Was it 77? Well, there you go. I thought it was 84. Thank you. 77. We'll have a correction on that. He said, Luke, trust the force. And then when he was uh, uh, fighting this ball that was now with his uh, laser sword, if you remember, they're standing there and he can't get it. And the, again, the wise old man sell, tells the young warrior, Stop thinking so much, Luke. Just go with your instincts. See? And Joseph Campbell says that those lines in a, you know, a, a vernacular movie, a common movie for the cinema, really marked the end of modernity. And, and, and so, and having said that, so we, now we see, you now you see what I'm talking about, is this inner world is the force within. Put it on here if you can, Stacey. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, she's talking to Phil. See, so I put it, uh, the force is another word for it. Trust your hunch. Trust the force. Trust the instinct. Follow that mystery inside. And see, the puny ego with all of its mind, thinking, 
and, and uh, uh, it runs out of options. It's limited, and that's the whole point of all of this. Um, so it's trusting the force within. Hmm. And see, everybody experientially knows what that's about. It's hard to measure it. It's hard to, I, I frequently, when in my counseling practice, when people come in and they're talking about problems, and as a good analyst, and they said, what should I do, Dr. Again? What should I do? And what does a good analyst say? What do you think you should do? What do you think you should do? Well, I, I, I came to you to, to help me with it. I'm going to help you with it. But what do you think you should do? I'm paying all this money. I expect to get an answer. See? <laughs> And what's really going on, and this is really the key to all of our journey, we're going to see it over and over again, what's really is happening is here's a little life, and we look for the authority, looks for authority outside of itself. And we do that growing up, don't we? We need mother, father, church, culture, police to tell us how to act. But in doing that, the ego, you have to have an ego for survival and... and um, uh, you know, living in existence, but the ego walks away from the inner world. And, it, and the real question is, who authors your life? The first half of life, it's, an, it's a biography. Somebody else is writing your life. Your culture, your family, biography. P-H-Y, thank you. Uh, the second half of life, and that's a psychological age. It's not an age of, uh, it's not a chronological age. And some of you are already there. In the second laugh, it's an autobiography. Is it you're writing it? What do you believe? What do you think? See? And so the struggle is with, is, is it an outer authority or is it an inner authority? That's going to determine us. And is, or is it a combination of both? And who decides? See? And post-modern, uh, 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 medieval times, we, we used to trust the mystery and we had sacredness of life. In our age of science and reason, we've moved toward uh, egocentricity and finding the authority in science, money, new car, relationship. What does the ego look for? Who's gonna, what's going to make your life what it ought to be? We look on things outside. Well, if I get with my people, if I get rid of all the people different from me, if I find the right religion, we find all these things looking for the right answer in a sense outside of ourself and perhaps maturity is the ability to look within and say, now, but what do I say? What's, what do I say? What works for me? And some of you in this room and other classes, you're already struggling with that with your parents. Because remember the first seven years of life, it's about they're the authorities from seven to 14 the peers start coming in. And uh, uh, in adolescence, it's about what do the peers think? How can I be cool, accepted, neat? What must I study to get a job, get taken care of? And then somewhere in the second half of life, it starts, well, what does my inner world say, myself? And no longer do I listen to what my parents say. Had a student in another class who got married a few weeks ago and really went against her parents' uh, wishes. And like I told her, I said, well, congratulations and uh, condolences because you've just joined the second half of life <laughs> and you're in the fray of the experience of, of, uh, of the unknown because now you're trusting your inner authority. Unless she's doing what? Putting the authority on this man. You direct me. You lead me. You think for me. I'm going to look to you to save me, rescue me, be my hero, protect me, give me all my dreams. And of course, he's doing the same to her. If I just marry you, I'll have nurturing and support, and I won't have to face my fears because you'll comfort me. See, we all do that in marriage. I, whenever I perform a wedding, I always feel like I'm an accomplice in a crime. <laughs> you know, people with all these idealizations coming together and knowing that down the road they'll find it's not all like that. There, there's, you know, it's like being with another human being is not full of fantasy, and uh, there's a lot of raw uh, humanness there. Okay, so here's what happens. So what happens is the ego must uh, begin to honor the self, that which is within. And in psychology, as a therapist, when people start having symptoms like anxiety, depression, uh, uh, psychosomatic, uh, physical illnesses, uh, often these uh, symptoms are relation problems. Often these symptoms are because the true self is trying to emerge uh, and the inner authority is trying to come up. 
Uh, a year ago, I worked with a guy who was 35 years old, had been a stockbroker for years, and he just wanted to, he wanted to be a, uh, a, a orthopedic surgeon. And he had saved some money. His wife agreed to go to work. They had kids. And, uh, and he quit. And to the chagrin of a lot of people, because he was really succeeding as a, uh, uh, as a stockbroker, he said, this is not what I want to do with my life. And so courageously, he began to walk away from what he should, ought, supposed to, said the outer world, to say, I want to do surgery. And, of course, that was a wife and two kids, and they downsized their house. They, you know, got really poor. And, you know, I saw him not long ago, and he's doing quite well. But that was at 35. Can you imagine? See, he started honoring that inner world. So you see the difference between the inner and the outer? I think it goes through with... Uh, uh, I think it goes through in all our cultures, too, is, is one of the greatest places. Let me do this again. One of the greatest places, what the ego does is it defends itself for its own mastery and power. And it creates its, uh, defenses like uh, uh, repression, things it doesn't want to deal with, suppression, things that have never come up, you're afraid to deal with, and then projection. Uh, we throw things out on other people. This is the way the ego survives, to pretend that it's in charge. And the other thing is through uh, idealization. And idealization is a way that I say, well, my life is good life, and it's fine, and I have this, and I have that. And the ego just gets all puffed up and inflated, uh, uh, thinking it's got it all figured out. And what we will learn is that at some point the ego has to begin to acknowledge that it is not the master of the house. There's something deep within that's moving. Uh, and so when ego runs into other cultures, uh, the other, other cultures, other races, other religion, any other, then the ego has to defend itself, rationalize itself, project on those people are evil. I don't understand who they are, so they must be evil. Uh, or... Gee, that's so wonderful. I must get that in my life because I'm, I'm no good. In it. There's nothing down here in my life. I have to go marry that person or get that new house to find life. And uh, so the problem is not so much the ego, all we need one. The problem is what's called egocentricity. And I want to talk a little bit about that in relation to the self. And let me, uh, I, gave you, I gave you a handout on this. Yeah. I have a question. Good. Push oh, the little button. I Okay, uh, I just wanted to know, um, where did, what does denial come in? Is that a defense of the ego? Too? Yeah, denial is a huge defense. That is. It's a, they said denial is not just a river in Egypt. You've heard that said before. Uh, yeah, denial is the first. You know, I've lost both my parents, parents and buried both of them over about 15 year span. And when I first heard that they had passed, I just uh, thought, no, that didn't happen. See, because my ego, I couldn't just absorb it. It was just too much. It's like, no, my father didn't just die. He'll be all right. He's coming out of this. He'd been in the hospital for about six days. But denial is a way, and, and just think as a little kid, there's certain things you can't take in, and you have to deny its existence. And then later in time, you begin to accept it and integrate it. Yes. Push the button there. Good. It's uh, didn't even know I'm lying. I didn't even know I'm, I'm lying? Didn't even know I'm lying. Where'd you get that? What do you think? Is it a def definition? No, it's an acronym. D-E-N-I-A. Oh, yeah, yeah, good. Anachronism of denial. That's good. Didn't even know. I am lying. I am lying. I am lying. Is that it? Yeah, you spell denial. D-E-N-I-A. Oh, oh, denial. Oh, okay. <laughs> I d didn't even, what? That's good. Didn't even know I am lying. Yeah, that's good. That's great. That's good. Ah, uh, I didn't even notice I am lying. That's good. You guys are sharp. Uh, didn't even know I am lying. That's good. And listen, the thing of it is, is we all sort of lie because we create this ego, this way of functioning in the world that says my race, my culture, my sexuality, my philosophy, my ideals are right and everybody else is wrong. <laughs> and the ego has to discover that isn't the truth. And that's what cultural psychology is all about is discovering, wait a minute, other people have a reality and experience. Yes. 
just wondering, so what if you do, like, you don't deny and you accept whatever it is, then what? <laughs> well, when you accept it, what happens? I don't know. You, you, you have, watch the water level on my little drawing here. You have a little more of your life that's conscious and you've integrated it. And so I've said, well, I'm afraid, you know. I, you know, to accept the fact that I get scared at times is human. And so, you know, the difference between somebody, uh, uh, fear is human. If I say I'm never afraid, well, I'm in denial. But once I say, well, I am afraid, but that doesn't mean I'm less than a human. Uh -huh. But now I can face my fears and work through them because I'm not denying that I have them. Another question? Yes. Um, what was it? Um, is it healthy to deny it? Deny? Or like sometimes you don't want to take it, I guess? Could you like deny it just to like not okay. deal with it? Would it be healthy? That, that's a really, that's a good question. I think in the long run, there's an, or this is what the self does. See, the, the self, the God within, is pushing me toward accepting reality. And here's what's interesting, is my false perceptions of reality can destroy me. No, wait. Reality can kill me. You can get killed walk out in front of a truck. Whop, 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 18-wheeler. Uh, but what will destroy me is a false perception of reality. Living in denial, pretending something that's really not true, living out of that for years and years will eat a hole in your stomach. It'll cause your back to hunch over. It'll cause you not to become fully human, fully alive because you're denying things that you must come to accept. And the ruthlessness of the self, and the self is really ruthless, is always pushing me toward truth, reality. See? And even if reality kills me, better to face it than to live in an illusion and a pretense like many of us do for, to, for survival. See? I just don't want to accept. I just, you know, it's uh, what's, who did it uh, in the movie uh, Gone with the Wind, Scarlet O'Hare. I'll deal with it tomorrow. No, not today. Tomorrow. I don't want to. See? And, and it's that infantile, pre-adolescent part of me that doesn't want to face reality uh, in what it is. And we have in this culture the longest adolescence of any culture ever. It goes on in our 20s and 30s where we're just afraid to take responsibility for our life and our choices. And so what do we do? We blame. Well, I'm the wrong color of skin. I'm the wrong sex. I'm the wrong national origin. I'm the wrong this. I'm, if only I were something else. Then, And see, we can go through life and those are problems. But to be in denial is to say, therefore, I don't have any choice and I'm a victim. And I, when we do that, I think we start dying. Uh, the, the, the truth is difficult. That's why most people just go back to watching TV after my classes and go, yeah, whatever, Dr. Again. Uh, but then life keeps pushing us forth to ask us to, to, to grow and to change. And in fact, because of the cultural onslaught in Houston, for example, there are so many diversities and so much differences, so much unknown that just attacks the ego that it, you either defend it, the unknown, or you start integrating it and learning. And the theme of my class is there's lots to learn from all the people that are different around us. Um, the, the enemy becomes the... Uh, well, let me, I'll just... Uh, yeah, let me just do this real quickly. Uh, I gave you a handout. Let me just kind of walk down it to a way of seeing. The enemy is not the ego. The enemy is really egocentricity. And uh, this is on, those of you on TV, this, uh, uh, you can get this. Egocentricity is that state in which a person is concerned only with his own defense, the fulfillment of his own ambitions. Egocentric ego, that's the E-C-E, -E, I put it, is to live out an ego alone without honoring the creative energy of the self. The ego alone is cramped and narrow. And up here at the top, this uh, Fritz Krunkel, who was a German psychoanalyst, he says the secret is the, e the ego is the devil. The egocentric, my way, my ideas, my feelings, my God. See, uh, that, the real enemy is when I get so focused on the ego by itself without acknowledging that there's something deeper. And just to walk down through these, no two people are alike in their creative or egocentric qualities, yet egocentricities are similar. But the unique self in all of us is very unique. No one is completely egocentric. Fear, ego fears run us, but the heroic true self may emerge in a crisis. I've seen some of the most self-centered people 
rise to the occasion with new power and love and sense of otherness in a crisis that they seem so narcissistic at a time. Another one is the egocentricity is identified with some form of evil. It's a betrayal of life itself, a betrayal of the creative potential and deep purpose. And there's lots of evil that roams through the world seeking out its own egocentric way in all of us. The ego is not negative. Only the egocentricity is limiting and destructive. Remember, you've got to have a good ego to function through life. But uh, the ego is a noble, essential aspect of the psyche. It's a representative of my deeper self. But it's egocentricity that's destructive. Number five is the egocentric ego uh, fears the inner forces as a threat to the egocentric ego's position. You know, as long as I'm in charge and everything's going my way, I do fine in life. Aren't you like that? But watch life tell me no. Watch me get dumped on, rejected. Watch something I'm expecting not happen. See, watch a loss that I've worked years to get, not get. And what happens is, is I just freak out because of my egocentricity. And what does that freak out cause me to do? I have to say, wait a minute. It's not all about me. We're getting my ways. It's something else at work. Another one is the egocentric ego has a special relationship to false joy uh, and, and false suffering. There's a lot of people that are happy, but they have no real joy because real joy comes in facing reality and working through your struggles and finding there's hope in the midst of things not going my way. And then false suffering are the people who use suffering as, well, you know, life is just so hard. I'm, uh, you know, as martyrdom. Oh, poor little thing. You know, well, let me tell you all the things that have gone wrong. And see, that's false suffering because true suffering will transform you. False suffering just makes you whine more and you use it as a way to make excuses in life. But real suffering, properly embraced, uh, will, will lead to a deep maturity of life and a deep in, a joy. A couple of more here. Egocentricity is prone to destructive emotions and symptoms and to inhibit the creative life. My anger I can use egocentrically, my depression, my anxiety. I can use all these feelings, it's poor self-esteem, bad. I can use all kinds of emotions to focus on me, 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 uh, and to destroy my life and others. It keeps me from being creative. Uh, the egocentric person is incapable of real love because of the, uh, he only loves to serve the ego demands. Genuine love comes from the self, from God within. Most of us say, I love you because you're doing good things for me. And when you stop doing what I want you to do, then I'm not going to love you anymore. Well, that's egocentric, immature love. Real love is, you know, the, you aren't very lovable, but I care about you and love you in a deep way. And just because it doesn't feel good doesn't mean I'm quitting. Are you with me? See, And that kind of love is rare. We say, well, just go get somebody else. Well... Ultimately, you have to sort of love someone through the struggles and, uh, and find out, you know, real love is something that is, doesn't come real easily. Uh, ninth one is egocentric has little or no moral instinct or a morbid, exaggerated one. People who have an answer for every problem in the world out of their religious world, they have a Bible verse, they have a cliche. You know, life is just not that simple. Although there's truths in those things, there's usually another side we have to wrestle with. I don't trust people that have an answer for everything. It's like, yo, you haven't been where I've been. Some of these things you have to walk for decades to find the answer, even while you search them. Another one is uh, cleverness and disguising motives or hallmarks of the egocentric life. You know, most of us think there's a shortcut to growth. <laughs> and so we fake it and pretend and move through life. We actually somehow think we're going to make it without surrendering to something greater. Um, and then the last one is the heavy price of the non-creative anxiety, depression, and loneliness. The heavy price of egocentricity is anxiety, depression, and loneliness. Um, and uh, let me just say this regarding uh, religions. If fear is what runs us, Fear leads to anxiety. This is the problem of becoming conscious. 
And that anxiety causes us to want to control everything, and who wouldn't? And that control leads to rules, and it can lead to a fundamentalism. And we create scenarios. I mean, I know people that the whole life is about getting more money, more money, more money for security. And, you know, how much money do you need? And when is enough enough? And people are out working and not loving their family and people because uh, the other side of the coin is uh, trust and hope and uh, transformation. Which can be read to a, a, a real faith and not just an escapist faith. And, and some of this comes from how we deal with anxiety, what uh, uh, James Hollis calls the three A. The anxiety, ambivalence, and ambiguity. And if you can't learn to handle these things consciously with the unknown, then what we're prone to do is to move over here and try to control life because we can't stand that we have to trust it. And that's why I'm saying I have a hard time trusting people who've got it all figured out. I would rather live in the opaque unknown of the nowhere, trusting a God I can't see, who I can get to know inwardly through my experiences, than to have it all figured out to deal with my fears. Give me uh, life's uncertainty and the abyss of discovery rather than having it all figured out and no adventure. Are you with me? And is you there can like see a happy that. medium there? Say it again. Is there like a happy medium in between? Yeah, there is. I sound like I mean, a preacher, don't, you, don't I'm doing it. Yeah. No, but I am probably uh, using that, that part of myself of, of trying to acknowledge that... Uh, yeah, there, may, there is a happy medium because we do need security and our fears do serve us. Good point. And yet, if I'm run by my fears, if that runs me all the time, I never have a chance for creative living because I'm just living in fear. And therein, we just stumbled into the great human drama. <laughs> Are my fears going to run me all the time or do I get to live creatively and discover new things in life? See. And, uh, when, and so we look at cultural diversity, religious diversity, we'll find ourselves in here somewhere. A lot of people I cut work in therapy, they come to me on this far side over here on anxiety and fear. And after getting in touch with stuff, they begin to move over and have more trust and not be in such control. Um, okay, uh, let's have our presentations. We'll, we'll see this same thing when we look at affirmative action and, and uh, trying to find fairness and all this stuff. So y'all want to come up and do our presentation? Great. Okay, um, about three and the first um, perception, uh, because group men are more salient for the powerless if country from gender. Suggest that blacks of affirmative action view the program differently. The, the article also talks of merit based selection of affirmative action, and it says that the power, the power mediates the perception of the merit. Achievement of powerful group members are thought to be merit based, whereas achievements of less powerful group members are viewed as group based benefits. And she'll go on with the rest. 
Okay, uh, to add on what she said, affirmative action, it has a lot of negative perceptions because some people perceive it as um, a form of, favorite, form of favoritism and even to the point to where uh, sometimes Caucasian people see it as being a form of reverse racism because they feel like that if jobs are given to minorities and women and stuff to white people, then they can be disenfranchised in the end. And uh, even, even some women who are um, not ethnic minorities, sometimes they feel that affirmative action isn't necessarily a good idea, but that's kind of ironic because affirmative action uh, benefits women of all races, regardless of whether they're black or white. It does benefit women. And I had two questions for the class. Um, my first question was, do you feel that affirmative action is effective? Why or why not? Yeah, has anybody benefited from affirmative action in here? Are you happy? How many think how many are for it? How many don't think we should have it? You don't? Okay, good. Somebody say why or why not? For either side? Yeah, why do you don't you think we should have it? Andy, you wanna answer it? <laughs> Well, you don't have to answer it. I mean, I, I don't want to put you on the spot. All right. Okay. Um, well, my high school in Dallas, it was a, um, my high school in Dallas was Tavview Magnet Center, and it came about as a, um, the, uh, the affirmative action as well as, like, forced integration because it was, my high school was composed of six schools under one building, and they were like uh, preparatory schools for different career fields in public service, health, business, uh, science, engineering, education, and social service, and then there was talent and the gifted. And basically, um, it was a lot of controversy because they wanted to build it in North Dallas, which is the more affluent, more almost suburban part of Dallas, versus building it in Oak Cliff, which is the more middle class, inner city, urban part of Dallas. And so affirmative action played a big part in that because um, a lot of social activist groups came together and said, no, we want to build this school here in the community because if it's in North Dallas, it's going to benefit those children more so. And they're going to have, even though it was a magnet school and catered to children, uh, who lived inside Dallas County, if it was in North Dallas, it would have more so catered there and the people in North Dallas would have made sure that it stayed that way and that it became almost an elite school instead of a school that appealed to everyone. And so I benefit from that because um, my home high school that I should have went to was predominantly black, but since I went to town view or whatever, it was, they accepted me because of my academics and as well as to fulfill the racial quota. So it was to my benefit and it was a really good high school and I don't have any problem with saying that I got there partially because of affirmative action. Congratulations. Um, Wonderful. My second question was, if you were an employer, would you implement the policy of affirmative action when hiring employees? Would they have to? Would they have to? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's it. No, no, Shapur has something to say. Oh. I think if I were the head, I think I would just go for the best person. I think I would just uh, look at if I have like a stack of 10 resumes and I'm going to look at two positions. I think I'm just going to hire the two people who are best qualified for it. That's what I think I'd do, regardless. I think I, I, think I did the same thing. Yeah. True. It is, regard, yeah, regardless of what you are, you know, that that doesn't play with me, so. I think I would just hire who's best qualified. Yeah, just to go back to your previous question about why or why not, I think uh, Afri or affirmative action is good. I think that, or I believe that I have the ability to to judge people on characteristics other than race. So that I think that making, forcing people to judge based on race, even if it is like, to correct past injustices and current injustices kind of creates a mentality where people are going to continue judging based on race. All right. Anyone want to add to that or is that it? Mm -hmm.
Thank you. Well, uh, don't go away. Uh, you know, part of what I was talking about, about egocentricity, affirmative of action, I mean, who's people out of the goodness of their heart are going to say, we need to help minorities get into the system, get into schools, get into jobs. But because everybody's so egocentric, I want what I want when I want it. And I'm in America, I have a right to be as selfish as I want to be. We put laws in that force people to stop being egocentric. Isn't that what that's about, kind of? Are, are we trying to force people to think in a bigger picture? Otherwise, if people are left to their egocentric ways, what are they going to do? They're going to hire their own. They're going to hire their friends. And it is a true dilemma. I'm not saying it's not. It's a true dilemma. Because I should have the right to hire whoever I want. But out of the goodness of their heart, the people with power often don't, aren't willing to share it with people that don't have it. It's a, it'll be a dilemma your generation will fight with <laughs> much more than mine did. Um, but it, but it's, it's a difficult, it's really difficult. Um, but, but it takes you having a bigger heart and a bigger mind than just being self-centered. That's why, part of why I presented all this. But anyway, I'm glad you, got, uh, you took advantage of it and uh, that it's helping you become yourself. That's good for all okay. of us. Great, thanks. It, we have one more? Yeah. Second article was on uh, racial quotas and how like people theorize that uh, affirmative action kind of indirectly leads to uh, racial quotas. Like Bush said that at the beginning of the article. Um, when Congress tried to pass a um, some legislation in 1990 that uh, Bush called a quota bill. He said that um, while it doesn't directly lead to quotas, like people, quotas is basically hiring by numbers. Like you have to have like a certain fraction of black people, a certain fraction of Hispanic people. Uh, he said it didn't directly lead to that, but out of fear, the employers would have to like, if I don't hire this many black people, I'm going to get sued. Or if I don't hire this many Hispanic people, I'm going to get sued. So he thought, it, he vetoed that bill saying that, uh, we don't want that to happen. I kind of agree with his point because um, if you've benefited from affirmative action, uh, when, how many of you would feel kind of bad? Would you kind of wonder if you really earned the job? Um, yeah, um, basically, I guess... Uh the the positive side to affirmative action I totally agree with you know to help out minorities but at the same time I think that uh, if I have my own knowledge and if I have something to offer to a company you know I'd like for them to see that you know over my status you know uh, what as as a uh, as as a Hispanic you know male you know because uh, m most of the time you know some people you know. Oh, just because, you know, they're Hispanic. Oh, we need more Hispanics. Let's hire some of them. And sometimes they're not even qualified, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to sound racist to my own people, you know. But, I mean, sometimes when you're not qualified, you're just not, you know. And that's my purpose for being in school because I want to progress. So that's my that's opinion. Right. Yeah. How many, uh, how many of you felt like you have, uh, I don't want to say cheated, but have been cheated by... Affirmative action, like how many white or majorities? Uh, you think maybe? Well, I don't. I, me personally, no. But I've, um, I have some friends who, in some instances, have seen, have have applied for certain stuff, and they've had way more qualifications and uh, perks than someone else, and that someone else got in because of the minority thing, which I don't, which I don't agree with all that much. I mean. Uh, it was for admission into a law school, and um, my friend got a 170 on his LSAT, and the highest you can get is 180, so that's really good. And I don't know, I don't remember what minority the other for this other person was that he told me about, but she got a 150, and she got in and he didn't because of the whole thing. So, and it's not me, but it's I don't think it's right. Yeah, the article talks several times about people who. Uh, Students who sue, who would sue the school, like Georgetown University, 
uh, Washington University. 1971, Marco de Funes sued the administration of, U of University of Washington for admitting 36 minority students whose uh, academic credentials were lower than his. And he kind of, that went back and forth. He won the case and then he got, it got appealed and then by the time it was decided he had already almost graduated so they decided to just not look at it. Uh, affirmative action, do you think that uh, if we had no racism, like affirmative action we only needed basically to eliminate uh, judging by race, but suppose we could get rid of uh, racism like totally, you think we would still need affirmative action? We wouldn't, right? I think affirmative action also helps put more diversity in the workplace, which gives, I guess, I guess it's better for business. They have, that's what they say, more diversity in the workplace. You get different ideas, different perspectives, and I think that's something that affirmative action kind of helps with. Helps. Yeah. yeah, but you know, Shapur's uh, example of his friend with 170 right. versus, oh, versus minority with 150. Mm -hmm. But see, if we kept following it through, the minority student might have been born in, in, in a less, uh, a, a, a worse school district mm -hmm. because she's a minority in where she lives. She might not have afforded the better teachers, the better whole school experience and knowledge and learning that the student that got 170. So she was treated unfair almost from the start because of her race and where she was born and where she was schooled. And so that 170 relative to her environment may be a more than, excuse me, that 150 may be more than 170 considering from whence she came. You see what I'm saying? We, we all want fairness at the point of getting in the school, but we don't look at the unfairness that was gone way before that, that has set that up. Yeah. Absolutely. It's like a double standard. It is a double standard. And so it is, you know, yeah, it does. That's what I'm trying to bring up. Yeah. Anything successful is more than just credentials on paper. I mean, in the law school example, she may have gotten a 150, but she may have had a really good interview, and they may have thought that she was more prepared for law school than the person who was. At. Like in medical school, you can't just go based off of credentials. You have to have people experience. They have to see that you're going to be a good, empathetic doctor. It doesn't matter how high your MCAT is if you go into the interview and they don't think that you're going to cut it. And so. It's not just credentials on paper, it's also personality, it's also other things you bring to the table. A minority such as like maybe an Asian person who can speak other languages in a business setting might be more appealing than someone who can't speak a language. They may have a little lower credentials, but that extra thing bumps them up there. But that is a credential. That's not... Well, credential, but as far as like, credentials like on paper, as far as like academics and test scores and things like that, that would be something But that extra. would be something you put on your resume, and if it was solely based on race and you were looking at resume and interview, that would be separate from... That's part of the diversity, then. Your resume is what gets you the interview. I know, but if you, were, if, if you had the interview and there was no affirmative action, there would, it wouldn't really matter if one person was more charismatic than the other one. That would still be a credential and something you would learn about anyone, regardless of race. Interesting point. Hmm. Interesting point. How many have benefited from a, being a minority race in any way? Benefited from it? Any? Well, have you benefited, Andy? Uh, I guess culturally and like as a person, I've benefited because I lived in Papua New Guinea for a while, and I lived in Mexico for a while, and I lived in a Mexican town for a while. So I guess as a person, I've benefited. Not. I don't think I was admitted to schools at least grade schools based on race. Interesting. Yeah, what was yours? Um, probably would be like uh, the financial aid the government provides for minorities like the various scholarships there are. Um, I, I think affirmative action is well done there. So, that's all. Anybody else have benefited from being a minority? I mean, yes. Put um, this little button over there if y'all have one. I know minorities also get uh, more scholarship opportunities and right. um, internships. That's what I'm doing right now. And it's only for minorities. Actually, yeah, part of this article is uh, right. scholarships. Yeah, scholarship policy. And Rhodes is about that. 
So. Yeah, and, and part of the point I'm trying to, to get us to see is that there are people in power who've decided, somebody, people decided not to be so egocentric, but to share the wealth, to, to, uh, to not just hoard the money in the majority race, or there are some people that fight for not being egocentristic, but being more soul-centered and seeing the larger picture. And, uh, you know, the invitation for all of us is to think about, am I just being egocentric? Is this just all about me? Or is there, and sometimes we fight for it and sometimes we don't. And I'm just honoring that it's a struggle and we should always honor both sides and walk through it. Um, there, yeah, anyway, anything else? Okay, good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do what it is controversial, and it? it's good, good stuff. And 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 part of my uh, this we're wrapping up today. Part of my uh, my uh, thing that I was putting here is uh, uh, would be to uh, wrestle with the questions on this side versus only finding the answers. You know, answers without wrestling. See, I'm I'm for moving toward wrestling to find new creative solutions. Let me give you a, something, and I don't think I did this before, but this helped me to understand problem solving is Hegel. Did we look at Hegel one day? Hegelian theory. And that is that every time we look at a problem, we come up with a thesis. Do you all know this? Have you all studied this before? Did we look at it in our class once before? We have a thesis, and then whenever you have a thesis, it will beget an antithesis. The thesis is, uh, you know, I'm living with my parents and I just love living. It was so nice and wonderful. But as I grow up, I'm going, I want my own life. <laughs> and we have this conflict between one side of an issue and the other. The thesis may be, I want closeness in a relationship. The antithesis is what? I need separateness. How close are we going to be? Are we going to smother? <laughs> or are we going to honor the separateness? And the conflict between these two causes something new which is called a synthesis and that would be wrestling with two different polar polar opposites if we struggle with it we'll come up with something new a synthesis and that synthesis will then create a what an antithesis uh, antithesis antithesis this is how we grow through life and that conflict will create a new Synthesis. See? And, and that's what we're seeing happening evolve through uh, culture, through your own personal life, through relationships, through uh, diversity. Is, and, and what I'm trying to make a case for in this class is if you can handle the conflict, you may come up with a solution greater than either side of an issue. Uh, Hegel was the one who Karl Marx studied from. And, and Hegel said the problem with capitalism is what? The problem with capitalism is there's people that can't ever get into the system. Because remember, it's all about freedom, but it's not about equality. It's like the survival of the fittest. Well, great if you're in the system. But the problem with capitalism is that if there's a unemployed people and there's people who will always be poor who can't get in. And the answer to that, what, what capitalism creates poverty or certain people that can't get into the system because the money is in the hand of the wealthy. Wealthy uh, Capitalism here. Now watch this. The conflict causes Karl Marx to come up with his solution. And what was that? Communism was a way to resolve this conflict. But then communism did what? It tried to get equality, but there was no freedom. And we watched Russia for 70 years said, we're going to make sure, well, sure everybody has equality. But they really didn't. But there was no freedom. And so what happened is it didn't work because there was no creativity coming out generating jobs. And that conflict, we don't know what it's going to produce, often will produce some kind of a, a sort of a, a, a capitalist socialist state, a, a, a free enterprise uh, enterprise state that has socialism in it. You see what I'm saying? Where, and out of that conflict, something new is birthed. 
And when we're so quick to come up with one, the solution, the opposite is always there. And if we wrestle with it, we'll probably come up with a solution we didn't know. I encourage my, you can look at me over here. I, I, I encourage people at all times to stay in the conflict and let something new emerge that you didn't know. I told you one time in class, you get a red hot coal stuck in your throat. You can't swallow it, you can't cough it up. And you have to suffer through the problem. And guess what will happen? A transcendent something will appear that will resolve the problem that you couldn't resolve. And that's what maturity and uh, uh, awareness uh, gets us as an opportunity to go there and to do that. Great. I'll uh, see you all next class. Thanks. Good presentations today. Thank you all.